the big man. Brendan Schaub joins us tonight. I want to thank Brendan for coming on here. Everybody knows uh, Brendan, not only from his, his MMA debut or MMA career, but he's also a co-host of the Fighter and the Kid podcast that constantly at the top of the iTunes charts, not just in sports, but in everything, the whole, uh, the whole gamut on iTunes. So, Brendan, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, man. Appreciate it. Yeah, I um, I've been aware of you forever, man. Obviously, watching you as a fighter. But what's so weird is we have like we have mutual teammates that we've you played with at Colorado. Um, yeah. With your football background, then I've been watching you fight forever, and I know you're uh, you're a Colorado guy living a. As anyone watching the video portion can see, you're probably close to the beach, tank top, <laughs> tank top, nice weather out there, man. It's cold yeah, and windy, right? cold and windy here in Ohio at the moment. But um, so you're a Colorado dude, but what are you living full time LA now? Yeah, full time LA. I've been out here about three and a half years, three and a half, but right under four. Um, dude, I, I was in Denver, born and raised, went to college there, University of Colorado, like you mentioned, and. Um, I just need a change, man. I, I, was, I was in the UFC for about, at the time, I was three, three and a half years deep into the, my UFC career, and I was coming off back-to-back -back losses, and I was going to the gym every day, and it was like, it was like, you ever seen that movie Groundhog Day? Yes. Of course, right? Yeah. That's how it was, man. I was like, I knew exactly what my coaches were going to tell me, what, what we were going to train that day, my schedule. And I was just like, dude, I'm, I'm never going to be where I want to be if I stay doing this. So I literally sold everything, broke up with the girlfriend, and packed all my stuff and just started driving to California. I didn't know anyone here, but I just knew that, that it was kind of a hotbed as far as mixed martial arts goes and um, – you know, there's just kind of a, a vibe here that I needed to get to. Well, you're big time, like, uh, whether you want to admit it or not, you're big time, like, media dude now, too. And that's what's cool is you're still a current fighter, but you're, uh, your podcast, obviously, is huge. You just had Conor McGregor on. I know. I listened to that one. He's a cool, yeah. cool character. I just watched a couple of clips of him stealing, right. stealing the belt from, uh, from Jose Aldo. Aldo. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but uh, you're, you're doing Fox Sports 1 stuff. You're all over TV. Is that like what you want to eventually transition to when you're done playing or done fighting, I should say? Yeah, you know, um, the, the, the Fire and the Kid podcast, you know, I wish I could say it was my idea and I was the brains behind it. But um, my partner in crime, Brian Callen, he's an actor, comedian. Uh, a lot of people, like, whenever I walk around, they go, oh, God, where do I know you from? <laughs> He's the he's that guy where you're like, oh, you're the guy in that, and you can't really put it on him. But he's in like The Hangover, Sex in the City, Ride Along, um, you know, About Last Night. He's in a ton of movies, and uh, you know, it was his idea. He had his own podcast, which was terrible. He had like it's like a one-on-one -on -one interview show, right? Yeah, it was one-on-one. -on -one. It was like ten <laughs> listeners, and he had me come on. And it went really well. We hit it off right away. Right when I moved to L.A., we hit it off. And um, he goes, dude, we should do this every week. And I said, yeah, that sounds great. Absolutely not. I don't want to meet with you once a week and talk fighting. Because anyone that knows me, I don't really enjoy breaking down fighting 24-7. Like, do you like talking about football, the ins and outs of the 3-4 scheme or 4-3 scheme of football? No, that's the thing. If you, if anyone looks at the guest list I've had, I don't think I've had any current players. Maybe a couple of former guys, but yeah, like I've had John Daly, the golfer. Um, yeah, like I said, just had Sal from uh, from Impractical Jokers. Yeah, I like it's fun to talk to dudes that are in different, that do different things in our. Like it's such a different world. Like you said, Brian's in all these movies. He travels and does stand up everywhere. So he's like a, it's a fun character. But I, you guys have the awesome little like banter back and forth because yeah. he acts like he knows everything and you just yeah. mess with him the whole time. It's an awesome show. I'm sure people will check it out if they haven't heard it already. But you know, I, I wish that was a, a bit him pretending like he knows all this <laughs> stuff. But that's Brian. For before we were filming yesterday, and he goes, "This is a true story." He goes. Bro, check this video out. I'm like, what is it? And it's a street fight of this little guy. It looks like Kevin Hart. He's like 5'3", and he knocks out this big, like, 6'8 six, six, guy. And I go, oh, damn, that's pretty crazy. He goes, crazy? No, man, that, that guy's probably a trained fighter. And I go, well, he's not. And he goes, no, he is, man. He probably had uh, boxing experience. I go, why? And he goes, well, just the way he's moving. I go, so from this street fight on a basketball court in Washington, D.C., you assume this guy, and literally, we couldn't start the show because me and him were in a blowout fight about this 
15 minute clip. You guys weren't hadn't started recording yet? No, they didn't want to record it because we were at each other's throats, man. <laughs> Hopefully someone had a cell phone camera and can post they, they that in like the unedited yeah, or the they, they did, man. In the they blooper did. reel. Yeah, that's what, yeah, it's funny, man, listening to you guys cuz I've heard Brian on there listening when he would be a guest with uh Joe on, you know, Joe Rogan yeah. experience. And Joe does the same thing and would shut them down, even though they sound like they've been best friends for a long time. Or, and Joe would do it. And then now when you guys are, are hosting your own deal, he'll, before he even finishes a sentence, you always, you'll always you cut him off like you're just talking about. I know you guys make shirts because, like, what is he, the, the Taekwondo champ? And I'm, if, you haven't, if you can't tell, Brendan, I'm a pretty uh, avid listener of your podcast. I love it, man. I love it. But you guys make his national Taekwondo champion T-shirts now after dude, he said he was? Dude, since – since I've known Brian, he told me he was a national champion taekwondo. So was that real though? Was that real, honestly? Because I would he really say? Or was he serious when he said that? He was dead serious for for probably three years <laughs> until we got around Joe Rogan, and he never brought up around Joe. And then I go, "Well, Brian's a national taekwondo champion, and Joe's a legit taekwondo black belt competition team. They're the same age and grew up in the same area. So Joe just starts drilling them like, "Oh, really? What weight did you fight at?" Brian's like, uh, 168, bro. He's like, yeah, that's my weight class. He's like, what competitions did you do? And then we just finally got to the bottom of it. Brian finally goes, all right, all right, listen. It was at a YMCA in Iowa, and it was my Master Kim's Taekwondo tournament. I go, how many guys were in the tournament? He goes, four. Said, all right, well, you're not an national <laughs> champ, but we'll just call it even. So that's where the shirt ideas come from. Oh man, that's why people are buying them. I know that's why people love your what you guys do because you have these crazy things that would be a bit, but then but it's reality. And then of course you, you're smart man. Make the shirts. When he I, now that I remember you you said that I remember when he uh, was talking about that when I was talking to Joe. I was YMCA Master Kim whatever. It made yeah. me think of uh, Foot Fist Way with <laughs> Danny McBride. Yeah, that's Dan McBride's first movie, man. That's where he got famous from that. That's that's all I was pictured in my head was like Brian. <laughs> I was like, man, I wonder if Brian had a little bit part in that movie, but I don't <laughs> think he did. But I he, wish, man. <laughs> I if, wish. If he did, it would be beautiful. That's uh. So yeah, people obviously will will listen to <laughs> to your podcast. That's not only uh that's going big, but you do like fight analysis and stuff on Fox Sports One. Is that you do that just to kind of keep you out there or keep you like? in your foot in the door with Fox sports, even though I know your podcast is done. Through yeah, them. A, a little bit like I'll, uh, I'll host on UFC tonight every now and then. Then I do a bunch of stuff. It's a show called UFC now on fight pass in, uh, in Europe and in, uh, South America and China. It's on regular TV. So I'm, I'm big international. Right? You heard that, right? That's where the cash is, man. You want to be big international, big in China. Yeah, I guess, I guess, man. Uh, but, uh, yeah, so I do that stuff. I enjoy that stuff because I know the sport really well, and the sport's been great to me. And I, I love the, um, you know, I, I just like knowing the ins and outs of the sport. But the reason the podcast works is because I can be myself. I don't have to, you know, I don't have anyone tell me what I have to talk about that day. I don't have anyone tell me certain statistics, stuff like that. And I actually got in trouble. I'm not going to mention the show, but I was on a show with uh, two guys breaking down fights, and we were mic'd up. And anyone who knows me, I joke around all the time. I try and make people laugh. And I thought the mics, when it went to commercial, I thought the, no one could hear what I was saying to my co-host. So they go, okay, commercial. And I'm just sitting there. My, my buddy, again, if I mention a name, they'll figure out who it is. But I go, he goes, oh, man, the podcast is killing it, man. I don't miss an episode. I love it. I go, oh, yeah, thanks. I go, yeah, I'm so thankful for that podcast. I don't have to dress up in this bullshit and take all these statistics. And I was like, and I, wait, I make way more money doing this. And he's going like this. He's like, I'm like, what? And then in my ear, the, the producer's all, hey, Brendan, everyone can hear you, so maybe kind of keep it down to yourself. I was like, oh, haven't been back on since, man. So, was, it, was there an audience? Is this a live audience there? No, oh, it's not. Okay. It's, in a, it's in a straight studio. Oh, so it just, just went, that went out. That went out on the air. You're saying to everyone. Oh, yeah. that's beautiful. I don't. Bad idea. I gotta check it out. Actually, I gotta figure out what. Bad what idea, my <laughs> man. I'll tell you off here. Bad All idea. Right. <laughs> well, that's well, that's what's cool, man. That's why I think everything's going to, to podcasting and online, and everyone's got YouTube channels and all this stuff because 
no one wants to sit there and listen to a dude. And a, I mean, there's a place for it, like a little two minute soundbite about what happened. You know, what do you think? What are your like, Brennan? What are your thoughts on the fight? And then you got yeah. you're a minute into your uh, your explanation of breaking down four fights, and you got a producer in your Tony to wrap it up. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't really get into the the ins and outs of of what's going on, and that's why I don't know. I mean, people there's a place for it. People watch it probably. People like me that don't know anything about fighting, no matter what you say, will believe it. So you can say True. whatever you want, man. You could just, True. you could, yeah, you could make up anything. Well, you know, his, he had a sleeve, ta sleeve of tattoos on his right arm, and his left arm <laughs> it was bare. So that's why I think he he left his left arm open for a for an arm bar, you know, for a kangaroo <laughs> arm bar. No, you know what the thing is is, uh, you know, the the fight community is pretty small, man. There's only it, and it's grown a lot bigger, but. You know, really, I think there's 400, maybe 450 contracted fighters in the world. In the heavyweight division, there's maybe 30 in the world. So you, wow. around just, you know, being the sport for eight years now, you kind of, you know, it, especially in the NFL, it's kind of the same, but it's a bigger pool. But in the NFL, or in the UFC, it's smaller. So, you know, I have stories. I've trained with a lot of these guys. So when they're about to fight, and, you know, this is the reason why the show with Joe, the fight campaign is work, you know, with a podcast, they, like you said, there's no one in my ear going, Brendan, you got, you got 10 seconds to do your spiel. You got to do this. I can tell the story of when Donald Cerrone, myself and uh, Brandon Thatch, you know, all these guys are world class fighters when we were security at a strip club. You know what I'm saying? Like I can go into in-depth stories because you personally know these guys. Yeah, that, that's got to be weird. Like. I don't know with the whole fighting thing. It's crazy to think there's that few in the whole world that are, are world class and are signed to you know have contracts to fight. Obviously, there's some underground guys fighting in, you know, in, in some middle school uh, oh. gymnasiums where they're serving <laughs> cans of Budweiser and Bush Light. That happens. I know that. I actually worked out. Sure. With, I worked out with a guy uh, here that um, he kind of went crazy. Had a little episode. I haven't worked out with him since, but I worked out with him for a couple of years. We did like. He has like he had like fifteen or twenty professional air quotes fights, and he was um, he was smaller than me, man. But he would we would work on everything grappling and striking and stuff. Nothing that would I would ever claim to be decent at. But it was a good workout, which is all I was looking for. But he did yeah. like, all of his fights were were those like um, like chain link fence octagon they would build yeah. like in a backyard basically. And he would fight. I saw some clips of him, and he would come up with these crazy gimmicks when he would come out. Because like, oh, we're all getting paid the same, bro. I gotta, I gotta find a way to get these fans to love me. So he would like, <laughs> he would like hold, like water with a ton of red food coming in, and spit it out like blood when he got to the cage and stuff. And he would, he would do all. And he was the best was he would do this like in his mid thirties because he went into fighting real late after he got out of the military. So, <laughs> Dude, that, that's the problem with fighting. Like I'll go to. Uh, family events or barbecues, something like that. There's a big difference between the NFL and playing flag football on Sundays <laughs> with your buddies, having beers, you know what I'm saying? Well, in the UFC, it's not a big enough sport. Like, I'll be at an event, and a girl come up to me and goes, oh, my, uh, my boyfriend uh, fights in the UFC. Really? What's his name? Gary whatever, Tumblr. I'm like, well, <laughs> yeah, I don't know him. She's like, no, actually, he has a fight this weekend. Hey, Gary, come over here. In walks Gary, out of shape, whatever, 300 pounds. Like, <laughs> for sure not in the UFC. You give a fight coming up? Yeah, yeah, man, next week at the uh, Grizzly Rose. It's two-for-one beers, too. I'm like, well, okay, not the same, but we'll just go with it. I, I think guess. I can get you on the VIP list. So tell Dude, you. that's what I get. I deal with it all the time. Well, man. yeah, because not only do people know you, but then you're – even if for some reason they don't know you, you're this big old monster that walks in, uh. tattoos, everything, cauliflower ears, so they're probably like – what does this guy do? They think you're a pro wrestler probably too. I get that a lot, yeah. 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 I, I'm not big enough for it, but when I had long hair, people would ask me that. Like, are you – I feel like I should know you. Are you a, Are you in the <laughs> WWE? Are you a wrestler? I'm like, no, man, I'm nobody. Just, you know, obviously <laughs> just, just keep going. Keep Dude, going I was, uh, when I first moved in my, my place here in, in uh, Marina – I was on the elevator, and it's an older, it's an older group around here. I'll put it that way. Everyone's older. I'm the youngest by far, and I have my tank top on, tattoos, gym bag, and I'm on the elevator with probably, yeah, I'd say everyone's over seventy at least. Everyone's on their, you know, on the back nine of life. To be nice, they're on the back nine, man. On the back three. Yeah, back three. Back three, seventy, three, and, seventy and up. Yeah. Scream Reaper is knocking on the door, <laughs> and it, it's just. You could tell they were talking before I got in the elevator, and it's just pure silence. 
And then finally one guy's like, oh, I'm going to go for it. He goes, what uh, what are you, a, uh, an NBA player or something? I go, no, no. He goes, NFL? I went, nope. Uh, Major League Baseball? I went, uh, nope, <laughs> no. He goes, oh, okay. And then just That's complete it? awkward so- silence, man. So I deal with it all the time. And that dude's too old to try to Google you and find out who you are, too. That's the problem. Most people, I'm sure you've probably been somewhere like in an elevator or in a room, and you see someone probably sees you, and then they end up, like, Googling you and looking at your picture doing this. I remember well, I was, Net worth. Now there's a net worth. <laughs> oh, God, yeah. Do. That's super accurate, too. Yeah, right? They're like, you, uh, you're worth 20 grand, huh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, man. Don't worry. I got this dinner, Brendan. You don't need to pick it yeah, up. Yeah, <laughs> like I, I get you, buddy. I feel bad for you. No, yeah. you, know what, you know what else I get? Because, you know, everyone knows, you know, A.J. Hawk, Ohio State, you know, first-round draft pick, all this stuff, baller. So no one's going to come up to you at a restaurant and be like, hey, A.J., listen, in your last game, man, when you go for a tackle, I need you to bend more at the knees and kind of drive through. I'm not making this up, bro. I was at P.F. Chang's after I beat Mirko Krokop. After I beat Mirko Krokop. He's a monster. For anyone monster, that doesn't know. Street monster. Look him up. One of the greatest of all time. I knock him out. Get the knockout of the night bonus. I'm at P.F. Chang's a week later. My face is all beat up. I had no surgery. The waiter goes, oh, Shab, what's up, man? I'm like, what's up, bro? He's like, great fight. Man, I just think next time, bro, with your jab, if you can just extend it out, man. I'm like, oh. you know, I'm always cool. I'm never, you know, mean to guys. I just went, oh, cool, man. Uh can, can you just get my orange chicken though, maybe, or you know, we'll, we'll figure this out later. But because fighting, everyone, everyone's been a street fighter, schoolyard fighter, or something, but they think you know they they know how to do it better than you. So you get advice all the time. When before you even mentioned that that the dude telling you to extend your jab, I was gonna like butt in and say, oh yeah, you just gotta keep that jab in his face. Like that's like what I hear people say because I watch, you know, I buy almost all the UFCs and. I don't watch much boxing, but I mean, I watched the Pacquiao fight coming up in May. But uh, uh, people will, everyone is a, like, everyone is a professional boxer or UFC fighter or anything whenever we're watching a fight. And I'm sure that's, I know that's how it is when people watch football games too. I understand. But they're sitting there like, man, come on, what's he doing? There, there's no action. This is a boring fight. Blah. You know, someone's on the ground or they're like the most technical jujitsu stuff ever going on. I'm like, I understand if you want to say like they're not striking with each other. They're not, no one's getting knocked out, but don't try to tell me these guys are bums. Like that's people Dude. just, people have like a, a warped sense like that they could just jump in there and do it. Dude, there, there's nothing worse than, you know, it's terrifying enough fighting another world-class fighter in your underwear <laughs> walking to the octagon. Nothing is worse or nothing will make you feel more like the movie The Gladiator. You remember The Gladiator before they walk out and they're all strapped to each other, change each other in handcuffs, and he looks down and homeboy's pissing on his leg because they're about to die, and then everyone's like throwing blood at him, like, oh, kill him, rip his head off. I'm not making this up. My last fight, as I'm walking to the octagon, some guy's yelling, rip his head off, Shab, rip <laughs> his head off. It's like, bro, you're making this way worse for me, dude. This is way worse. I wasn't scared before, now I am. Now you've ruined my night. Oh, yeah, and then your, your opponent comes walking out, and he's yelling the same thing to this guy. <laughs> kill him, kill Shab. <laughs> Stab, step on his throat, curb stuff. <laughs> like, 100%. Like, what do you want, buddy? You just want both guys to die? <laughs> People are, yeah, never satisfied. I've been to one live UFC event. Um, it was in Vegas a couple years ago when Anderson Silva fought. I think it was in, he fought Chael twice, right? Yeah, twice. I, I think it was when he fought Chael the second time. I could be wrong. But it was Anderson and Tito was on the undercard. I don't know which one it would have been. Um, but it was it was crazy, man. Because I've gotten to know uh, Dan Henderson a little bit over the years. And Dan's a, yeah. you talk about a crazy old wrestler, that old yeah. school throwback, man. Mm-hmm. Dan's not, big, not a big dude. Fights at 205 and doesn't even weigh 205 usually. Not doesn't true. walk around there. Um, but... I was the people around me, like I was sitting there. I was like, "You got." I'm, I didn't say anything, but I'm like, "This is this might be the toughest group of people I've ever been around in my life." If you didn't know any better, if you listened to them, like, Dude. and not only toughest, but they were a black belt in every single martial arts discipline there is oh, too. Yeah. With how well, they were talking, I was like, my wife would ask me like, "What 
what was going on. I was like, I don't know. What do you? I don't. I don't, <laughs> I don't fight. Know. Yeah. I don't know. They're trying to kill each other. Like I can't. <laughs> I'm not going to pretend to be able to say like I know what they're doing. You know, like I'm just watching as a fan, and I respect the sport. So it's the, it's the same in football, though, man. Because uh, uh, I went to a Chargers game recently, or whenever I watch the games with my dad, and someone goes every single play. My dad goes, I don't get why they just don't blitz. I go, every play dad? He goes, yeah, you got to get pressure. I'm like, well, you can't do that. It's not the way it works. <laughs> it's the same thing in, in the UFC crowd. You hear, I'll, you know, I never watch it in public, ever. But I have before, a long time ago, and two guys would be standing, and the guy goes, I just don't get why he doesn't do an arm bar. Well, God. It doesn't, doesn't make sense, my man. It doesn't, it doesn't compute that way. It's the same thing to me when I hear someone go, oh, why don't they blitz every play? Like, it doesn't work that way, man. But according to my dad, he could be a defense coordinator for the Cincinnati Bengals. <laughs> I'm sure there's a lot of guys out there that, that feel the same way. But, I mean, I try to – I don't know, man. Like, I, it's weird because I – no matter what I'm watching or, or doing, I just try to watch with, like, a good, healthy respect for what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And if I don't like it or I don't – I'm not entertained or whatever, I'm like, I'm, I'm, I can leave. I'm not going to ever leave, like, in the middle of a guy's show if it's – stand up or whatever i'm not gonna ever boo anybody i mean people are allowed to boo that's cool if they feel like the product that's out there isn't there <laughs> isn't up to their standard but i don't know maybe it's just because i've grown up in it playing all sports like i know it's, how it's like i know it's like tough no matter what and that's why i'm a terrible coach like if someone tries to bring me in to coach like a little kid's camp it's my nightmare first off because i'm it just feels like the longest day in america but like a little kid will miss a tackle or something this kid will be like in third grade, and these dads and people are yelling at him, oh, you got to get there, you got to kill him, keep your head up, and uh, and uh, they're like, come on, AJ, tell him what to do. I'm like, I don't know, man, just uh, that's was, was tough play, buddy. That little running back's quick. I don't know. <laughs> Derek, to, what do you want to do? You're, yeah. Yeah, trying to get there. Like, and I can tell, you, you know that when a kid is that young, too, if he has a chance to even become get a college scholarship or, you know, if they have a chance at – and making it to the next level, which, you know, even, even making it like on the varsity team, you can kind of tell at a young age, I feel like. I feel like you can pick them out. And that's – fighting's got to be – uh, yeah, fighting's a little different, but fighting – you fighting, started so late, didn't you? When did you start, like, fighting? After college? Yeah, after college I was 20. I mean, not, and, I mean professional fighting because I, I, we have some, some mutual friends we have in common. And all I <laughs> – I remember asking them about them, like, I had some Colorado buddies, Brad Jones. They're, I'm like, so, you know – you know Brendan? Like, I was like, yeah, I listen to, I, I'm telling him, like, yeah, I listen, he's got a podcast, it's great, man. You ever watch him as a fighter? Like, yeah, man, all I remember is Brendan, yeah, he's a big old strong dude. He'd just go out and he would just kill dudes and just <laughs> get in fights and just beat them up on the side of the road. <laughs> Yeah. The guys that are younger than you, that's what that's the, the, uh, the legacy you've left at Colorado. So I should, you should be proud of that. I just had this big afro, which is like wilding out. Yeah, Brad was the smart man. Um, dude, it's, as far as kids go, you know, I, I had, uh, today when I left the gym, this dad goes, Oh, w watch my son. The kid's probably, probably nine, maybe 10. And he's hitting mitts and doing jujitsu. And like, he's really doing MMA. He's not focused on boxing or anything like that. And the dad goes, when he moves back, his legs are coming together. The, the dad had never been in a fight in his life, never trained. He goes, his legs are coming together. Isn't it easy for a takedown? I went, I mean, I guess I went. He's nine, man. Let let him have fun, man. You want to work on his footwork right now? Let's just let him have fun. I'm telling you, you're, you're gonna you're gonna you know make him hate the sport. And that's the thing with today is you see, you know, I'm sure when you were a kid, you played all sorts of sports. You weren't just focused on football, football, baseball, basketball, of course. Of you course, play, man. You play everything, and it makes you better at the other sports. Exactly. Well, now parents want to specialize their kids in one sport and they're playing it year round and when they're not in season there were these specialty coaches uh when i uh tim tim tebow really good buddy of mine he was working with uh with chris winky well chris winky was at the time was the head coach or, or quarterback coach of some big school in florida it was like it was straight out of harry potter this private school and they had something like two or three heisman coaches on the high school staff and these Kids would go to class for three hours a day and then do three hours of football. And this is year-round, man. And they would do all this specialty. And I looked around as a private school, and I just thought, dude, it doesn't matter. Whether you have Chris Winkie telling you what to do at a young age or not year-round, man, either you got it or you don't. But if you're doing it at such a young age, I mean, you're going to get burnt out, man. It's not the way to do it. Oh, my God. There's a documentary on um, 
HBO, something about something parents. I don't know if you've seen it. It follows around like probably four sets of parents with their kids. And it shows like it's these parents that are literally just killing their kids so hard on them, pushing them. One's a golfer, one's a basketball and whatever, all sports, football. And it's like it, it made me, I mean, a lot of documentaries, a lot of shows will make you mad. It might be the number one show that I lost my mind watching. Like, really? These dads. Oh, my God. There's this kid, this, this little girl. She was probably like eight or nine. She's playing golf, and she's in these little tournaments. And her dad follows around every single shot. And she was, like, shaking on the court. She just <laughs> literally can't hold the club. And he's sitting there, what are you doing? Follow through. Look, that's a terrible shot. And I was like, bro, someone, someone honestly needs to – we need to bring one of these MMA guys to choke you out on the Slap course them, and leave you in the middle of the fairway because it was – the kids – every kid started, like, crying – because they started hating it, and they would yell at him and tell him, "I don't even like football anymore." Of course, man. Yeah, it's you, uh, that kills me, man. And I got two little kids, and they, hey, I'm like, hey, man, you guys have fun, uh, girl and a boy, four year old girl, two year old boy. Would you, uh, would you, you know, knowing what you know now with the concussions history and stuff like that, would you let your kid? Would you push your kid towards football? Uh, I don't, I don't plan on pushing them towards anything, like pushing them wherever I, they're, they'll naturally, I think, go to whatever, like they're best at, or they have the most fun, but, oh yeah, I would let my son play football. He, um, I've thought about that and it's crazy now with everything going on, um, with, like head injuries and all that, but I would do it. But the thing that I'll say, I, I've told people in, in national, not national, but just like if I've ever done an interview and they ask me about what do I think about like head injuries and having kids get hit, I'm like. I don't think there's any reason ever for little kids to hit in practice. Like, you can have tackle football in fifth grade. I think you should. They should yeah. be able to tackle. But not in practice. Not Monday yeah. through Friday. There's no reason. I, I started playing in second grade, and we started killing each other right then. Every day in practice. Every day. And, and those are like – when I t when you talk to any doctors, I'm like, there's so, they're so little known about the whole subject of brain injuries, too. It's so like – we're just such – we're at the beginning of knowing anything, I feel like. But – like these, how could this? You got a developing brain that every single day is has to gaining so much momentum and developing your whole body and everything about it, and you're just gonna start having this blunt force trauma every single afternoon because you got some stupid coach that claims he tore his ACL a senior in high school and that's why he didn't get a scholarship to play at Florida State. Like, come on, bud, come on now. <laughs> like, so I, I, the only thing I will have a problem with is if I go like watch if my son that plays football whatever he's he's welcome to do whatever he wants um when it comes to that but what if i see him in like fifth or sixth grade and i see them like banging at practice which i'm hoping the the kind of i hope they change the laws by now i know california has something something going on with that like there's no reason for kids to hit in practice there, I agree. there's just no reason at all it's so at i don't know man it's well because with, with the up with the nfl and ufc man recently you know with all this concussion all these statistics coming out Homeboy from San Francisco 49ers played one rookie year and was like, you know what? I'm done. Do Borland, man. He grew up, he went, he grew up right in the same town as me. He went to high school. He just went to the Catholic school. Yeah. Chris Borland was stud. He had a great year, stud. too. Super stud. So, you know, for me, and I'm sure you get it, and you obviously your wife is a smart gal. She sees it. Does she say anything to you? Does she say anything like, I wish you would, because you have, you know what I'm saying? You have kids. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm nine years in now. This will be my 10th season, which I can't believe it's that far along. Um, no, she knows. Um, she's smart enough to watch me and, and see if, I've, if I'm deteriorating, <laughs> deteriorating yeah. in front of her, which I'm, I've been very lucky when it comes to head stuff, knock on, knock on whatever. But I, um, I got a hard head, man. I've been lucky. Yeah. Like Genetically, I feel like some people are more, you know, more predisposed to, to have head injuries and stuff like that. Um, like her brother, my brother-in-law, he's had some of those like scary deals, you know, puking after the game, things like that. <laughs> It's been back in college and stuff when he's had those. I don't know if he wanted that public or not, but there you go, Brady. Um, <laughs> enjoy that, Brady. Enjoy that. Enjoy answering those questions, Brady. What? You told me that fantastic offensive line for the Cleveland Browns didn't protect him. <laughs> oh, well, I don't know about when he was in college, in the pros. I'm talking college. I'm, I'm going to go ahead and assume here. I'm going to do him a solid and assume here. You know, he got a raw deal, man. You get drafted like that, and then you go to Cleveland, and you just have no help, man. They're like, oh, you know, people say stuff like, oh, it didn't work out with Brady. Put anyone with that team, man. Good luck with that. Yeah, quarterback, I say it with every position and every sport, really. It's 
there's so many things that go into it. You got to be in the right place at the right time. And there's, yep. there's definitely this, the, also the same thing of being in the wrong place at the wrong time where, I mean, especially quarterback is so hard. I can't even pretend to think that playing quarterback in the NFL, it, it just blows my mind. I played it for my last four games, my senior year in high school. I was always like the tailback, but a guy got hurt and boom, I was in. And I was like, oh my God, this game happened so fast. <laughs> and, I was, and I was in high school. <laughs> so, right then, I gained so much respect for quarterbacks that day. Well, think about how many quarterbacks come out every year into the draft and how many legit stud quarterbacks in the NFL actually turn into consistent, study starters. It's, it's rare. So it's tough. so it's, tough. You're right. It's so tough, especially as a quarterback. Like everything. It all works together. You talk about a team sport. When you're playing quarterback, man, that team around you has to be able to like, – first off, obviously, they got to protect you, and then you got to have guys to throw the ball to. I mean, it's just so much goes into it. You're right. It's, it's not cut and dry like everyone thinks every, – you can't – yeah, it doesn't. It's not a weird all. deal, man. How Are they uh, – so that's like uh, – that's always a question people have, I think, when it comes to like your guys' big training camps you have. What are you, like eight, 12-week camps before a fight? Yeah, I, I, I usually do longer camps, which is, you know, I, I think from, um, you know, from the whole team getting together after my last couple of fights, you know, over my career, I do too long of camps. I've, I've always been that, that just that crazy work ethic. That's what I've been known for. So I love doing 12 week camps. I enjoy camp. I enjoy the process. I love all that. But I always, by the time I get to the fight, probably three weeks out, my body's just deteriorating um, it's hard for me to wake up um you know so I, I think we need to do shorter camps and also my next fight which i announced on uh the conor mcgregor show uh that i did on firing the kid i'm fighting at light heavyweight at 205 now so i was gonna just, ask just, you about that man yeah. what are you what are you walking around at now <laughs> so my coach i worked out this morning he goes you're uh you're looking beefy my man i go well yeah <laughs> Yeah, I said the diet starts on Monday, and because I just had my birthday week, so I celebrate for a week. Like Paris Hilton, yeah, I know. Yeah, Paris had a week too. That's good, man. (laughs) Dude, I I got on the scale this morning. I was two fifty six. So that's that's mostly water weight. You're probably really two forty right now. Yeah, yeah, whatever. My coach was like, "Okay, okay, we have some work to do." So, so you're walking around two fifty six. So let's just say conservatively you walk around at 250 because you're a monster of a dude what are you six five six four okay you're walking let's say, just say you walk around 250 when it's when you're not coming off your birthday week and <laughs> you're gonna fight at 205 what do you weigh like let's what do you weigh two weight what what do you plan on weighing say two weeks out of the fight 225 220 okay and then so you you have a saturday fight and you're getting weighed in friday friday what, what will you weigh like Wednesday or does all your most of your weight come off like the night be- the day before yeah so the, the plan is it's, it's funny because um you know I've, I've had some more uh well-known nutritionist guys reach out to me to, to help cut weight Little Dolce and you talking to Dolce Dolce certain guys yeah man and um for for me um you know I, I want to use a guy who you know who's passionate who I'm his only client who I can call in the middle of the night or who's just, you know, a guy who to give him a shot. So, um, you know, right before I came on here, uh, I, I talked to a couple of number of guys and uh, this guy, Anthony out of Long Beach, uh, it's, it's all he does. All he does is help people cut weight and makes their meals and nutrition plan. And he, he's local. So I'm going to use a guy like that. And the plan is <clears throat> to get to, uh, and we start Monday, so it should be interesting. So if my shows start to suck, it's because I have no carbs. So um, I'm going to get down to, to 225 in, in 10 weeks. Cool. And you didn't announce an you didn't. I know you announced that you were going to fight uh, at light heavyweight. Did you announce an actual fight? No, because the, the the you know I've never cut this much weight. I I got down to 225 for a, a jiu-jitsu like super match, and I just did the diet myself. But I've never had to cut to 205, so we're going to do a mock cut in the, you know, the next 15 weeks and see, you know, see if I, my body actually responds and performs. And then I'll tell the I'll green light the UFC and say, all right, man, I made 205. Give me a matchup. So, you know, I'm sure they'll toss me some monster. They don't give me easy ones. So if you get, if you're going to do a mock cut over the next 15 weeks. Yeah. And get down there. 
And so what, you're going to go in and show them, like, hey, I can do this, man. Look at me. Like, I can still, whatever, I got energy, I can fight. And then they'll schedule a fight, and then you'll basically go into, like, a whole other training camp? Yeah, basically, yeah. I'll, I'll take some time off. You know, I'll take whatever, two, three weeks off from training. But, you know, since my last fight, this is the longest layoff I've ever had. I fought December 6th. I had a degenerated disc in my in my neck, which I, you know, I've been fortunate, man. I haven't had too many concussions, no surgeries really, no injuries from playing football and you know fighting. And this is the first kind of nagging injury I've had where I went into the fight and I, I knew I'd be in trouble with my neck. So you know, I've, I've taken three months off from sparring or anything like that, and I've just been doing jujitsu and, and lifting. I've been just doing straight meathead old school lifting with my with my trainer Ben Bruno deadlift uh squat freaking benching one rep max too on bench and just like yelling with my shirt what? off one rep did you have the bench shirt on where you can't walk where you know you walk around your, your arms your, you can't put your arms down I wanted one but he wouldn't let me do it <laughs> Louis Simmons west side barbell it's in Columbus <laughs> it's near us if you know about Louis um, I've heard about that gym, man. I feel uh, like I should go there. I yes. feel like I'd fit right in. Yeah, you would. You would definitely fit in. You got to do a lot more steroids to get in there, though. Yeah. <laughs> like, no. maybe, maybe when I retire. Maybe when you retire, yeah. Then you go to those anti-aging clinics, get all juiced up. I'm sure they're everywhere out in California. Are you kidding? Oh, me? in LA, man, they're like Starbucks. They're just <laughs> they're everywhere, bro. They got to be with the way people aren't allowed to age out there. So yeah, you got to. Uh, Gotta get all juiced up and be like 58 years old, tanned, ripped up, like three and a half percent body fat. So a, guy, so a guy can go, you know, dump his first wife and pick up a second <laughs> wife that's 30 years younger. <laughs> Claim he's happy. Oh, it's crazy. I love it. Uh, no, yeah. Life is great. Yeah, zero kids. Yeah, meanwhile, she's texting you behind his back the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> Texting these young MMA fighters behind his old man's back when he goes to bed at nine o'clock. <laughs> uh, but I was gonna say about your training camp, how do you like figure out? I, I hear Joe talk about it on his podcast a lot about guys are talking about how much they spar going into camp, and I can't imagine wanting to spar a ton before a fight, especially if you're already, you know in your thirties. I'm thirty one. I think you're thirty one as well. Like, yeah. why do you are do you spar that much going in now? I've gotten smarter, man. I've had to, you know, back in the day, you know, it, it, it's tough, man, because when I was coming up, I was around MMA royalty. So, um, you know, I'd walk in the gym and Nate Mark Hart, Shane Carwin, George St. Pierre, Rashad Evan, Keith Jardine, those were the guys who took me under their wing. And they were tough guys, man. We would spar a lot. So I was like, okay, these guys are successful. So I'll just do what they do. So me and Shane Carlin would literally, the gym would stop and watch me and Shane just try and rip <laughs> each other's head off. And if anyone knows Shane Carlin, former UFC heavyweight champ, 300 pounder would cut to 265. He's just a monster, man. So um, I, I was raised and brought up to, to train that hard. And, you know, if I could do it all over again, I, I would, dial that back and it's not about you know you're, you're tough already you know it's an, it, when you spar like that it's basically just saying yeah I, I think I'm tough and I, I need to prove to myself and my ego that I am tough so you know the the older I get and the more experience I get and you know now I'm around guys you know one of my good friends and training partners Leota Machida he tells me man rest is more important than your training he's like I know you're an over trainer and you know sparring you don't have to spar so much you know how to fight there's no reason for you to take hits in the gym that, that you, you know you don't need so for me it's, it's about getting smarter and I, I think that's the evolution of the sport you know the UFC is so new if you have to compare it to football we're wearing those leather helmets right now we're in leather helmets no face masks those bullshit cleats you know it's just, it's just ponies the, yeah, the old ponies so, the black ponies they're three inches long you know <laughs> so it's it's just not good man but um i think as, as guys get more educated and you know uh you get guys you know like myself kenny florian uh chael sonen guys who have a voice and they're using it they're expressing it i think it's going to help this younger generation go listen man you're already tough there's no reason to take hits and and you're not getting paid in the gym the wars in the gym that that's those days are done i i can't imagine being in there, oh god, because you guys is when I, whenever I watch any like of uh, the UFC embedded or you know or the, like the YouTube clips of you guys training, it looks brutal. And anyone knows that 
a lot of you guys have like wrestling backgrounds and, and I remember when I was at basketball practice and I'd see our wrestlers come out of the wrestling room every day at practice just looking like death, you know, their shirts are like just drank, it looked like they jumped in a pool and they just gotten beaten up for two and a half straight hours in the, in the hot sauna that was the room basically. And so you guys doing that every single day and then every once in a while catching a shot and getting knocked out or something, that would be, I would think that would be the biggest nightmare ever and hopefully you guys have coaches it's got to be huge to have a coach around you to figure out like okay this is when we got to dial it back here and but yeah you're right two big monsters like you no one wants to be the one to let up so I can see how it happens egos man it's egos and when you talk about you know um coaches again man it's educating these coaches the same in the NFL you know some coaches you know uh they, they don't hit during the week Listen, if you get to the NFL and you don't know how to tackle, you probably shouldn't be there. There's no reason to hit during the week. So so with, with our coaches, it's just like I said, man, we're still in leather helmets. So the more the fighters get educated, the more the coaches get educated. Now you're having former fighters who are coaches. I, I think you're seeing a, a better product out there. So do you have, a, like when you're in L.A. now, do you have a – is it all under one roof or do you got to go like one place for jujitsu, one place for your striking? Like, do you have to Dude. bounce around? Yeah. I'm, I'm, uh, you know, in camp, I average right around 200 miles a day driving, you know, cause I, I drive to, from here to orange County at rain training center where I do my wrestling and grappling. And then I'll go from there to Torrance, which is about an hour away for jujitsu. And I'll do boxing in Beverly Hills. So, I'm all over, man. I, I go to where the very best are at. It's tough to find everything under one roof. Again, that's the evolution of the sport. I'm sure one day, or there, there's super gyms like uh, AK in, in Northern California or ATT or Greg Jackson's gym in Albuquerque. There's these super camps where they have it all under one roof. But for me in L.A., man, it, I have to go kind of drive around. And, and, again, people, you know, the, the life of a fighter <clears> – <throat> It's it's it. I wish I could say it's all glitz and glamour, man. It is a a grind like no other sport, and I, I get this all the time. And like, oh well, how do you think a guy like Vernon Davis would do in the UFC? Well, Vernon Davis wouldn't sign up for this. Vernon Davis is such a athletic freak. It's like, listen, you can grind for twelve weeks, three times a day, with only Sunday off, and then fight another train killer. And, you, and there's no discipline. So if you want to take a day off, take a day off. If you want to do this, do this. So you're basically your own coach, really. It's just you're not going to get these freak athletes because the money and, and the grinds. not saying you guys don't grind, but it's a different type of grind, if that makes sense. Oh, it definitely is different. Um, and yeah, the money in, in MMA is, is nowhere near what it should be for paying fighters. That's for sure. When you look at this, this uh, Mayweather-Pacquiao fight coming up and what – Pacquiao is making like 70 or 80 mil and, and Mayweather her is making over a hundred on the first, the first fight. And they're, you know, I'm sure they're going to rig it up. So there's going to be three fights. So, you know, Pacquiao is going to hopefully knock him out and then it's going to come back and then there's going to be a third grudge match. That's what everyone is planning. I'm sure. But you guys like, it's crazy to see what UFC fighters. I mean, you guys, they don't even get a fraction of what these monster boxing guys get. And really in boxing, I don't know how they get away with paint. I guess because there's only a couple guys that people care about watching. Is that why? And, and since you guys have yeah. fights every like every two weekends a, a month, you know, or what? Yeah, you know, you know, in boxing, you know, everyone compares UFC to boxing, but in boxing, you know, there's there's Manny Pacquiao, Floyd Mayweather. Those guys are your you know legit superstars. When the UFC, we have a, a, a lot of stars, man, and at the same time. Um, you know, we're not to, to where boxing is at. You know, still, the Manny uh, Floyd Mayweather fight, numbers-wise, will, will kill anything the UFC's ever done. But, you know, the UFC's getting there. Again, we're in the leather helmet stage, man, and there's no union. Um, it, it's tough. It's tough, to, it's tough to have a voice, man. You, you'll get, you know, it's tough. Oh, yeah. It, you're definitely in the, in the early stages, but that, the guy I was telling you about that I used to do some training with, he would... <laughs> He would go into fights hurt all the time, and so I guess whatever fights he was at, he would get coverage. He would get insurance. Like, they would cover his hospital bills if he got hurt in the fight, so he'd just go in there with injuries, and he'd, <laughs> he'd go in there. He'd, he'd, like, limp his way into the fight and try to find a way to knock the dude out. He's like, well, either way, I knew I was going to I was gonna finally get a cast on my arm that I needed. I had a broken yeah. arm for three weeks. Dude, I, I've heard guys doing crazy stuff. 
like they they like tear something in their knee, but they somehow still get cleared and they fight and then they get surgery on their knee. It's all covered. I'm like, I guess that's worth it, man. Oh God, yeah. For now, until you're 38 and you can't walk and you're in a wheelchair and you're. Your kids, I agree. Your kids are carrying your food around for you. You know what? For, for me, it's tough because, you know, the, the UFC has been my uh, golden ticket to the chocolate factory, man. You know, getting on the Ultimate Fighter was the best thing that ever happened to me, and I've created this career for me. And, you know, the podcast is doing great, and the media is doing, stuff is doing great for me. And uh, I have these other sources of income, and, you know, it, 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 it's tough, you know, I, I I don't know how much longer I fight. I I know I have one more. I have to do one more because it's bigger than me. I I feel like if I didn't, I'd be letting not only myself down, but I'd regret it, but also my fans. You know, I'd I'd let them down and other people down. And um, so it's tough, man, because you know there's some guy out there, there's some guy at 205 or some heavyweight out there who's who's not comfortable, who's not living on the beach driving a Porsche. You know what I'm saying? So he's out there in his basement maybe taking a bus and he's some monster who's chomping at the bit to get in the UFC. So, you know, for me, it's a balancing act right now, man. I got to be honest. Yeah, man, it's got to be, uh, yeah, it does have to be weird like that because, well, that, that's like the good, I mean, it's, that's almost like the downside of you being able to do a lot of other things. You know, you, like you said, you have a lot of other sources of income. A lot of fighters don't have that. Mm-hmm. Even guys that are established like you and have been doing it for a long time. So yeah, it's like, yeah, what you say you say at least one you have at least one Joe, why is that just because you don't want to you want to go out on your terms or something? Yeah, kind and of. And I'm yeah. not saying you're going out, but you know no, like you no, are, no. Yeah. You just yeah, have like a burning, you know, you got to at least get out there and test yourself one more time. Uh, you know, I I've, I've always said my entire career I'm like god, I'd, I'd love to fight at 205 and cut weight and everyone's always told me, "No, you can't do it. Stay at heavyweight. It's too much of a cut. You can't do it." I, I just want a challenge, man, and it's like <clears throat> it, it's more of a challenge to myself. It's crazy, and people are like, dude, you don't have to fight. You, you have all this other source of income, and it's not about that, man. To, to me, it's just uh, I, I, I didn't get into any of this for money. I think anyone who gets into anything for money, they never end up being successful. For So for me, I got into it for the love of the game and the, the fight game, and this other stuff just happened to fall in my lap. I happened to be pretty good on the mic and in front of a camera and um none of this would be possible w- without fighting so i i i know i have to do one more and we'll take it from there and yeah. it's gonna be the hardest fight in my life and it, I, everyone asks me well who do you want to fight i do not care man i just want to cut 50 pounds and make the 205 mark that's all i care about cm punk that's it <laughs> i don't know is he, what is he fighting does he even know what weight class he's fighting yet I don't think he does, man. I think maybe he's fine at 170 or 185. Oh, God. I'm sure people – well, you were in the – weren't you in the house with Kimbo on the Ultimate Fighter? Yeah, I was in the house with Kimbo, man. Yeah, the Ultimate Fighter 10. He's a great dude, man. I've heard that from everybody. I've heard you say that, and then I've heard a lot of people tell me, like, he's honestly, like, a really good guy, really good. And anything you see, like, on uh, anything other than his old school backyard fights when he's not talking, he's just fighting and killing dudes, he, like – you could tell he seems like a great dude. Like, he cares about people. Yeah, he's just, he's like a, a family man. You know, he has whatever something like six kids, uh, all, same wife. He just he's just worried about taking care of his kids, and he, he's just like a really he's not. And it's it's messed up to say, man, but you just you know you have these stereotypes of a guy, or you know every, everyone like me. You when you YouTube Kimbo Slice, you get these gnarly backstreet fights. He's in a beater, knocking these dudes out. So you're like, oh, this dude can't be. You know, he can't be a good guy. No, he's a great guy. He's a guy, I'm telling you, man, he's a guy that you'd want in your foxhole. He's a very good dude. He's fighting soon, too. He's fighting Bellator against Ken Shamrock. Oh, he is. I saw that, man. Oh, see, I would, I would watch that fight. I, Ken, I wait, fight. how old is Ken Shamrock? Is he 50? He, yeah, he has to be right around 50. I was at a charity event like a year and a half ago with Ken Shamrock. First off, I was scared of him, A. <laughs> and B, I'm not – he was like – I don't even know how to describe how he was. Like, he just, like, just looking, like, wide-eyed. Uh, 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 like, just, <laughs> like, looked in great shape. But, yeah. like, he probably wanted to wrestle you, bro. Yeah, I know. He's probably, like, sizing me up, like, uh, you think you're tough, buddy? I'm like, I'm, I'm, like <laughs> I just held my hands up. I don't want anything to do with you, sir. <laughs> but he was – I can't believe he's fighting that because I remember thinking, like, someone asked me. Everyone knows at this event, like, musicians, all these different – they're like, that's, yeah, he was, like, fighting back in, like, UFC 1 or back in the day over in Pride yeah, and all that so. stuff. He's fighting, 
And I'm like, he looks like he definitely wants another fight. I don't know. So, <laughs> <laughs> so he's, he was really nice, but he just looked like intense. <laughs> yeah, man. That's the thing, like, you know, with Kimbo or Ken Shamrock or in, any of these fighters, you're not going to meet too many with an ego because the difference between fighting and all these other professional sports is in mixed martial arts, you if you're training – with the right people, you're going to get humbled every single day. Because whether you're a national champion wrestler, whatever you are, okay, we well have to go box a stud. And if you're a great boxer, you have to go do jiu-jitsu with this world champion jiu-jitsu guy, if you're doing it right. So most of the fighters you meet are going to be super humble and very respectful because they get humbled every day, man. So that big head really doesn't happen because they're getting broke down a reality check every single day, which you get some of these other sports – you know, these guys are spoon fed all their lives and you think they're the greatest gift to God and because they're not getting humbled, man. It's because they're either shooting, you know, basketballs into hoops or whatever. But in combat sports, you're going to get humbled really, really fast. There's so many. Uh, yeah, there's so many disciplines. You're right. You're going to get tapped. If you're going to jujitsu. You can think you're the greatest boxer ever. You know, you're the greatest striker. You're going to get tapped within three seconds. And so, yeah, you, oh, can't, you can't carry that around. That's why it's, that's why I think fighters are are so uh you know like personable and relatable to people too because you you guys you guys are doing that and it's it's a little different when you're you know different sports guys are when you're born a freak sometimes you don't have to <laughs> certain yeah. guys around in, in pro sports they don't have to do a whole lot to to be one of the best you know you're you're born a monster you're like, oh, yeah yeah just kind of i don't know just i don't really work out i just kind of hang out and just go dominate. <laughs> go catch yes. three touchdown <laughs> passes. <laughs> Gotta hang out, win awards, and dominate, my <laughs> man. It's like, oh, that's that's fun. I'm gonna go to the weight room and yeah. So yeah. I, I I think for me, especially, you know, I went to training camp with the Buffalo Bills. I think it, at CU, I realized it a little bit. I've always been known for my work ethic, but I realized when I got to camp in Buffalo that not everyone in life starts from the same starting line as far as genetics go. Nobody That's does. Like, no. Oh, oh my wow. God, nobody. Look at, okay, prime example, I use them all the time. Brady Quinn, my brother-in-law. Yeah. That dude can sit there and have milkshakes every night right before bed, and he's going to wake up and be more vascular with a six-pack. Yep. Like, that's Brady. He works very hard, but yeah. he was born a freak with, yep. you know, olive skin and super handsome. So, yeah, and then just jacked. I didn't have that. I was like, I'll be in the – sorry, Brady, I'll be in the weight room super pale and – Squatting, <laughs> squatting. That's, I won't look like you. <laughs> that's how I was, man. I was, I've always been kind of that, you know, I was the 16 year old girl with, with body, you know, uh, complex. I've <laughs> just always been that way, always. Where my buddy's like, hey, you want a, you want a beer? I'm like, nah, I'll just, I'll pass him off some water. Like, what's wrong with him? And I was worried about, like, you know, getting love handles or something <laughs> like that. That's good. I mean, there's just something to that. I, I always talk to comedian guys about that. They have like that. I don't know, not anxiety, but whatever it is, like you have something that keeps you going and keeps you driving towards things, and that's why I'm sure you, a big reason. I understand you want to keep fighting, man. I would, I would too, man. It's like, uh, I don't know if it's like not go out on your own terms or whatever, but I've heard people will say that to me about playing football. They're like, man, what you, you got nine years? Like, what are you doing? Why are you still playing? You got a ring? Like, why are you? Well, I'm like, well, what do you what? I have other things that I'm passionate about and I care about, yes, but why would I stop something that I love? You know, I enjoy it. This is what I, it's not who I am, but it's what a big part of my life and it made everything possible, but I love it. You know, it's, it's what you're passionate about. Why would you just stop cold turkey for no reason? Yeah, I, I agree. It's, uh, you know, I, I would, as much as I would say, oh, we should get paid more, this and that, I, I would do this for free. It's my passion. It's what I enjoy doing. I'm sure you would play football for free. It's really not about that, man. No, and that's uh, sometimes it's frustrating when you look around and everyone doesn't have the same attitude. You know, you, I'm sure you see that as fighters, but any team sport, it's got everyone's got to be on the same page. And I've been a part of some great teams that, yeah, when everyone usually puts their ego aside and does, uh, kind of wants to win. The, the number one thing on their mind is, hey, if we win, everything else will take care of itself. That's the best teams I've been on. When that's greatness, man. That's yeah, great. Start. That's true. Lewis Howes, School of Greatness. You, you, that's right, I, man. Yeah, Lewis hooked us up, gave me your email. Yeah, after, that's uh, our boy. I, I heard that. him. He uh, he sat in for Brian on on uh, on the fighter and the kid. Oh, that's right. Yeah, that's right. so you guys sat there together. It was funny, man. And Lewis, like, I, I've never even met Lewis in person, but he looks like, and when he would be like, um, if I see pictures of him or whatever, I talk to him over here. He looks kind of big, and then you were sitting next to him at your guys's in your <laughs> studio, fuck, and just big old shoulders, like, and he looked. I was like, oh man, Lewis looks tiny. Bro, I'm a bulking, bro. Lewis. 256 after the the birthday week. 
270, here I come. Maybe I'll fight at super heavyweight. Just, yeah, dude. just go the opposite way. I don't know, man. Uh, look, Lewis, though, Lewis isn't a small dude, though, man. He's a tall dude. Yeah, he does. I, yeah, I know. He was a big receiver. He's Ohio. He's an Ohio kid, too. I'm an Ohio He guy. is, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Ohio, Ohio's a theme that always comes up on here that annoys people. But I don't care. It's mine. My show. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna start to wrap it up here to let to let you roll and get back to your your uh, deadlifts and squats. I'm sure you're in your, you got your third session set up to get uh <laughs> probably get some heavy heavy uh, deadlifts and followed by some RDLs and then one rep max on bench and then you got to arch your arch your butt up way high in the air, you know, and get it. That's so, what I do, bro. Yeah, That's what I do, man. <laughs> arch your I butt was way nervous up. for it too. I was so nervous. I like did, I lost sleep the night before. I'm like, God, I hope I make the weight. Wait before so, your one rep max. Yeah, I was nervous, man. I haven't done it since college. Dude, I'm just – I think you should be happy you didn't tear your rotator cuff off. It's some meathead stuff, man, but sometimes you got to do that just to get back to the old glory days. Oh, I, I had freaking my gym, my old school college shorts on. They really – my ass cheeks hanging out the back. They really didn't fit. <laughs> I had this raggedy meathead cutoff shirt. It said like 2003 uh, Big 12 North Champs, and then, yeah, man, I was ready to go. Chalk, everything. That's right. That's that's your foundation. That's what made you who you are. That's why you can't get away from that. I, I'm a big like, I love squatting. Just squatting is my thing. I, I got this new, in my basement. Like we bolted it to the wall. It's like a a rogue squat rack that can fold back into the wall too and lay flush with the wall. That's basically, sweet. it's awesome. And so like, and I that's all. It's like I can't stop squatting here. In so the, do in the off season. you in the off season? Do you do your training yourself or do you get with a coach? Uh, I got one. I got a guy here. Like I don't. I, I have um, I have strong opinions on these on a lot of these gurus that say they're gonna, you know, well, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna get you right. I'm like, well, buddy, I don't ever get wrong, so I don't have to get right. Like, <laughs> I'm gonna just. How about I just stay right the whole year? Like, yeah, right? <laughs> I don't take you. I don't ever take big breaks off. I know I I tailor my my workouts to how I'm feeling if I'm coming off of surgery, whatever. And so, but I always like to do something. But I have a guy here that I've been working out with uh, in the off seasons forever, and he's a big old monster. Uh, uh, dude that actually worked out people but like worked out Brady when Brady was like 10 years old like he had a place here and now that I built a house I do it all I'm pretty much self-sufficient here got my squat rack now that's all I needed to complete my my weight room and I got all the I got room it's awesome I got nine acres I can run around with I was telling yeah. Lewis I'm gonna do I chop wood in the back I drag dead trees out of the tree line I chop wood I burn them at night for my kids it's pretty sweet, man. Oh, it's amazing. I got German Shepherd, another Belgian Malinois. I got some dogs that just, yeah, they run around with me, and we just try to, yeah. Dang, I'm doing it wrong in L.A., man. You can't get the kind of land and stuff out here. No, yeah, if you got like $100 million, maybe. Yeah, unless you're Scrooge McDuck, and that ain't, yeah. <laughs> unless rough. you're that dude, I, I hear you always referencing it. You guys went to dinner with a billionaire, and he, tried to, he was trying to wrestle you or something. <laughs> yeah, true, yeah, literally trying to wrestle me. <laughs> dude, I get people to ask me to arm wrestle them all the time. That's all. Like, so don't do like this. Don't hold their hand. Let's go, bro. Come on. Come on. And I'm like, no. First off, I tore my right pec like six years ago. Absolutely not. I'm not arm wrestling, A. And I was a pitcher my whole life, too. And all I did was throw fastballs. So this shoulder does not feel good arm wrestling. And Dude, I, I would, I, I just like, I just want to throw a jab right at their nose. Like, put my hand up like this and just jab them right in the nose. Dude, I get people all the time. Uh, because they think I'm a fighter, they think I'm like this uber aggressive guy. Couldn't be further from the truth. I like to joke around and keep everything lighthearted. But to relate to me, they'll tell me their old fight stories or how last week they're at a bar and they got in a fight. I'm like, dude, I don't care, man. I, this this makes me not want to be your friend. <laughs> well, it, like real real fighters don't fight, don't walk around the street fighting people. That's the that's what they don't understand. You guys like. You get it all out in the in the octagon, like you don't need to walk around telling people you're tough. That's what exactly, man. I think I never heard a. That's the old saying. Like I've never heard a tough guy have to tell me that they're tough. They just this is true. That's that's them. And so yeah, that's a, that's the thing you got to deal with, Brendan. Big old big old handsome devil walking around the beaches of L.A. People just want a piece of you. People want a shot at the title. <laughs> girls too. <laughs> girls want a shot at the title too. I'm sure with you. Shot at the title, my man. They see you selling all this merch from the fighter and the kid and everything. <laughs> <laughs> they see you blowing up, and then, then all of a sudden they see you in the octagon. They're like, oh, they just get enthralled by you. Look at this guy. Oh, man. They start trying to contact you on Tinder. I don't know. I don't, I don't know if you have any... <laughs> The big brown unicorn, my man. The big brown unicorn. Oh, that's great, man. Well, <laughs> 
I appreciate it, man. I'm going to uh, going to let you roll, get back to that nice weather. I, see, I can kind of see through the windows out there. Um, yes, sir. Talk to talked to Bill Goldberg, the old wrestler on here a couple months back, and he was in a, his brother's restaurant in San Diego, and he panned and, like, showed me, walked me out, like, walked his laptop out on the beach and was showing me the view and everything. I was, Looks good, buddy. It was, like, February. <laughs> it's, like, February and ice storms here, but that's sweet, man. I, I like it. Like, Drago. I'm like, I'm like Drago. Well, no, I'm like Rocky when he fought Drago. My bad. That's right, man. You don't want to be Drago. I was watching that montage yesterday morning, I think, while I was working out. And Drago's running around. You know, he punches the speed bags on the big old track when he's wearing his, oh, yeah. his leotard or unitard. Hell, yeah. Old was, school, man. <laughs> old school and just injecting D-ball directly into his arm <laughs> as, he's, as he's doing these weird Russian machines. Yeah. It's good. That's what I envision you doing, minus the D-ball out there. Yeah, right. <laughs> you want to retire. Just get on that Drago program. Get on that Drago anti-aging program, Brennan. Right. All right, man. Well, appreciate it. Thanks a lot, man. We will... Uh, We'll put you a little. Your Twitter, Twitter is. That, I, I was just combining Twitter and Tinder. Twitter, Tinder, Tinder. Twinder. Maybe that's a business idea. I'll think about right? it. Right. Twinder. Um, your Twitter is what at Brendan Schaub. Yes, sir. And we'll put we'll put that up and put we'll uh, link your the Fighter and the Kid podcast. All your awesome merch. We'll be we'll be watching you also on your uh, your journey down to two hundred five. And can't wait to watch you get back in the octagon, man. It's going to be fun to uh, to see you all. Your face all sucked in. You're going to be all anorexic in there, just knocking people out. <laughs> That's the plan, Doug. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I hope I don't die trying to make two hundred five. <laughs> we'll figure it out. Yeah, we need you around. Don't worry, you'll uh, you'll make it. I have faith in you. You'll thanks, great, brother. Man. All right, man. Thanks a lot. Really appreciate it. Thank you, dog. Go Bengals, man. You yeah. got a fan in the Bengals now. All right, man. Thank you very much. All right, much. brother. I'll talk to you soon, man. All right. See ya. Thank you for joining in. Please visit thehotcast.com where you can discover the next guest, get a little more information about why this exists, watch past episodes, or link over to iTunes and tell some friends, too, so we can all hear more great stories together.